Hello, and welcome to Histories Made, part of Heritage Open Days, Edible England, on behalf of Chesterfield Museums. Today, we are going to look at the Victorian farm and how the farmer and his wife would make their own food and be fully self-sustainable. First off, we're going to look at milk and cows and, of course, everybody's favourite thing, butter. But just how is butter made? Well, let's start at the very beginning with the milkmaid and the cow shed. First of all, the cow would be brought into the cow shed using a rope halter like this. The rope goes over her horns and her nose and she will be led in nice and peacefully. She will then be tied up to the wall and given some food and of course her bell will be around her neck. This helps the milkmaid to identify which cow it is that she's bringing in off the pastures. The cow is then secured using a chain around her neck and made comfortable in the milking shed whilst the milkmaid goes about her work. Sitting on a three-legged stool she will then set about milking the cow as best as she can. The milk will go into a wooden pail and three or four pints will end up in a bucket just like this. The bucket of milk will then be taken into the kitchen. Off she goes to the kitchen and in there her husband or herself will pour the milk or the cream into the jug through a muslin. Now the reason for this is to separate off any dirt or hair that may be in the milk and so it's vitally important to make sure that no dirt is poured in and contaminates the product. It is quite a delicate and laborious task. And there you can see floating on the top of the muslin some hay and some hair. The milk is then poured into a jug or into a bowl and the bowl will then be covered over with a cloth and set aside to allow the milk to start to sour and to separate. This is a vitally important process to set aside on the kitchen work surface and left to its own devices until the farmer and his wife think that it might be ready. Once they believe the cream to be ready, they will separate off any butter grain, leaving behind the butter milk, and that can be used for baking or to be sold on. The cream is then poured into the churn, making sure the dog doesn't get any of that. And then the dash is put into the churn and securely fastened on top so that nothing is wasted or indeed spilt. The churn needs to be soaked to ensure that it is watertight. And now begins the hard work, up and down with that churn until the cream starts to solidify and turn itself into butter. This can go on for quite some time, but on a hot summer's day, it can take as little as 20 minutes. You can see the process getting harder and harder. But still, our milkmaid keeps going. Some 20 minutes or so later, that cream will hopefully have turned itself into butter. But the process is not over yet. She's looking relatively happy, so it looks like it might have been a success. The dash is put aside, and let's see what's inside that churn. Well, it is indeed butter. The next job of the milkmaid will be to get the two butter pats, or butter hands as they are known, and to put the butter onto a slab of marble. It is vitally important at this point that she does not touch the butter herself. She doesn't want to use uh, her own hands because she doesn't want to contaminate the butter, but also the heat from her hands may cause it to turn into liquid. And so a marble slab is used. Once all the butter is out of the churn, oh, there still seems to be some left, a quite productive day so far. She will start to work the butter between the two butter pats. The idea of this is to make it malleable, but also to soak out any excess buttermilk that might still be in there. Once this is done and the butter has been worked, it will be formed into a pat. 
So the word we still use today, a pat of butter, comes from this very process that we see the maid undertaking now. She has quite a lot of butter to work and seems to be doing a reasonable job given that it is 27 degrees of heat. Will it form into a butter pat? But it's sort of getting there. And here is the butter pat and all the instruments used in the making of butter. Next, we turn our attention to the farmer or the shepherd and the sheep pen. Alongside his boffy, which we will see in a moment, is the sheep pen, made of wood, and it is where the sheep and her lambs may be put. Here he shows us the, the hay uh, container that he has made here. It is made from strips of wood which are bent over and stuffed full of hay, a manger, just like we may be familiar with on Christmas cards. Stuffed full of hay, it's then turned over and the sheep is able to pull out little bits of the hay to keep herself well fed and in good condition. Of course, water will be provided and there is shelter from the sun or from the wind and the rain. The sheep pen is of course secured with a gate to make sure that the sheep is well contained and kept safe from the elements and from any other obstacles. And behind the shepherd here, we see his field where the sheep may safely graze and his boffy. And inside there, we see some more tools of the trade. One of the most iconic tools of the shepherd is the crook. The crook can be used as a walking stick, but it is also very important in helping to look after the various sheep. And different crooks from different counties may have a different appearance. But this particular hook can be used to be put around the sheep's neck to pull her back or to hook around her leg to make sure that she comes back to the shepherd when he needs her. As he is showing there, the hook is a very versatile and useful tool for the shepherd. We also have the drinking horn that can be used to deliver medicines to the sheep should they require them. One of the most prevalent diseases among sheep is worm or parasites and the medicine can be mixed up and used uh, on this horn here to be poured down the ewe's neck. Her mouth will be forced open, she'll be held in the crook of the shepherd's arm and this uh, cow's horn will be used to deliver the medicines or anything else that may be needed to be fed to the sheep. Behind here you also see the kettle and the stove, vitally important not only for the shepherd's well-being but for the sheep as well. And here he shows the process of holding the sheep under his arm and delivering any medicines that may be needed. Shearing is of course vitally important for the sheep's well-being and for the farmer to earn some money. And here we see various shears which can be used to make sure that the wool is safely and effectively removed from the sheep. And the shepherd's toolbox. Here he shows us a standard wine glass. He then uses a piece of wood which has pith through the middle, which is removed using a piece of wire. A simple cork is then added and it can be stoppered into the bottle like this and can be used for the artificial feeding of lambs if the ewe is not providing enough milk. A very effective and clever way of making sure that the lamb is fed and nurtured well. He also shows us a very intricate device for a lamb that may have lost its mother or vice versa. If a lamb is stillborn or it's died, then it may be skinned and the skin of the dead lamb put onto the sheep to make sure that the surrogacy is effective. The shepherd also underneath his bed has a little crate with straw on the floor in which he can keep a lamb that is sickly or that needs his help. and that all-important stove providing warmth for every living item that was in that bothy. But 
The sheep trade is not just about meat. In fact, that is very rare. In the Victorian era, it is primarily about wool, and the wool industry was enormous during the Industrial Revolution. Bales of wool would be taken to the market and sold, and it is that that is used to make the money for the farmer. It is then used in the mills to provide textiles right the way across the United Kingdom and sold right across the world. If the sheep is used for mutton, it is very unlikely that the farmer and his wife will eat that themselves. It will be sold onto the middle and upper classes, and indeed was a favourite meat of Queen Victoria herself. It can be made into a wide variety of dishes and is exceptionally tasty. And what of pigs? Well, pigs will eat the leftover food and be kept in the pigsty just outside the door of the cottage. <clears throat> they will be fed slops. And of course, the pigs will be butchered for their meat. <clears throat> and a village community will butcher their pigs one by one. There's far too much meat for one farmer to eat all of it. And it is preserved using salt or smoke, depending on which part of the country the farmer is based. And the hearth and the home, the very heart of the farmstead, a place of warmth and of solace and, of course, food. So here we enter the farmer's cottage. You see his vegetables grown from his uh, very own garden there, beetroot and onions and cabbage. The larder, the all-important fire. And we see the kettle, apples picked from the tree, eggs from the hens and milk from the cows in the jug a place to rest his head at night and that all-important life-giving fire the farmer is sitting by his fire and here we see him with kettle in hand ready to make tea or to add it to soup and the fire must be kept going at all times of the day to ensure that food can be cooked effectively. There is an arm that can be swung out, various hooks on it, and the kettle, there we see, hung on the hook and hoisted over the fire. And with a fire like that, it won't take too long to get boiling water. Don't forget to use the cloth. It has indeed been over a live flame and can be very hot. And then the skillet on which can be made oat cakes. And these are a vitally important part of life in the Peak District and in Derbyshire. The oats will be put over the fire and a kind of bread cake will be made and eaten, a staple of their diet. And we have another skillet or a frying pan. And there, again used to make the bread cakes. The frying pan we saw formerly was equally good for eggs, bacon, or frying any sort of meats. There is also a cauldron that can be used. Food will be wrapped in individual parcels and meat and vegetables will be put on to boil. And there will be pies made or fruit put into boil, apples or blackberries, seasonal fruit. All of this will go on the cauldron together and the meal would be prepared all in the same water. Hence the expression, of course, boiled beef and carrots. And this pot here used for stews, mutton, beef or pork, all cooked together to make a delicious stew over that open fire. It is hard work, but so rewarding. Everything can be done together. And after a long, hard day keeping the cottage and the farmstead running, the farmer will take a little time for himself, using the fire to light a spill, and to sit back with a well-earned puff of his pipe. The fire will light the room as darkness falls, and the farmer will too light the candles so that they do not sit in darkness. And there he is, our farmer, 
and his well-earned pipe. 